Hi, my name is Peter Soren. I'm the CTO at Expel. Please forgive the phone that's ringing in the background. This is a hotel room, so I don't actually know how anyone's calling me, which is both amusing uh -huh. and somewhat disturbing. Uh, I'm the CTO at Expel, uh, Expel.io. We're a managed detection response company. We've built a SaaS platform to uh, enable um, our security analysts. We run a security operations center 24-7 to deliver uh, high quality service to our customers using their technology stack. We integrate with it, which means we're processing a lot of data and looking for ways to make our analysts uh, efficient so that and efficient making high quality and quick decisions as they go through the detection and response process to drive um, value to our, or ensure that our customers have great security posture and, and great uh, detection and response services 24-7. Awesome. And Oded? Hi, guys. I'm Oded. And I'm the head of the detection group, the R&D group of the detection here in Perception Point. And our main uh, product is email security but Perception does a whole range of uh, products for detection uh, of any incoming traffic into the organization, whether it be uh, links, URLs, emails, or files coming in from the uh, collaboration channels as S3, Google Drive, OneDrive, SharePoint, uh, Dropbox, and S3, anywhere you can store files. We also provide scanning uh, with uh, API, but basically uh, my group, detects incoming traffic, whether it be files, links, or emails. Awesome. <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about today um, is mostly about how um, AI and machine learning are kind of transforming the field of cybersecurity, um, both on the threat side and the solution side. Um, and I want to explore with you guys kind of you know all the, all the trends and developments um, in this area. Um, I also want to kind of talk about like the, the, the challenges and opportunities that 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 come up um, as you start thinking about using um, uh, ML and AI in, in this space um, and what technologies you guys use. Um, so let's try dive right in into like our first question. Um, so maybe Peter, you can you can start us off um, and and talk about um, kind of like the the approaches that you take to cybersecurity with the advent of you know, different uh, um, AI and ML techniques. Um, how how have they impacted kind of like the way you think about cybersecurity and, and the, the solution stack that you guys have? Um, you can, I guess, compare and contrast like the um, existing methods that you've been using, the tr more traditional methods that you've been using so far um, with more, um, uh, I guess, modern techniques um, that fall into the realm of ML and AI. Sure, uh, I'll do my best. It's, uh, we'll see. We'll see how much of that question I get. Uh, do help me if I if I miss a piece of it. Uh, sure. I think the, starting with um, uh, an adage that at least at Expel we're firm believe, believers in, which is you don't automate what you don't understand. And I think one of the challenges, uh, one of the challenges, but and also opportunities is um, early in the the journey in cybersecurity with machine learning, it was very black, black box and a lot of vendors were kind of hailing it as a catch-all solution. And the, it wasn't even an under delivery. It was just, there was very, there was no delivery on the, some of the promises. And I think that's created f fairly a lot of skepticism and, and the, and some challenges in bringing the, the true impact of, of some of the, the capabilities that machine learning brings to bear in an industry because we had a false start in how we talked about it over the past, you know, I, I look back 10-ish years. Um, but we are starting to see some really good use cases emerge and some real opportunity to um, use machine learning effectively within in cybersecurity. And I think some of that comes with, uh, because of some of the explainability research happening in other uh, adjacent fields uh, around how, how models are performing and, and what they're doing. But if you think about cybersecurity early on, it was really focused on rule-based and signature-based classification. Are these network packets bad? Is this file bad? Um, and as um, you know, cybersecurity evolved and the threat landscape evolved, that became untenable because that was being done a lot of times by humans or there were some techniques in there, um, algorithms to help write rules, but there it was rule-based. And so evading it was 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 not hard. And then the number of variants kept increasing. Uh, and so the first use case is really a, that how do you use machine learning and cybersecurity from a defender perspective is to solve a classification problem. Um, and that's where we saw, I think, the first impact of machine learning, where they were able to uh, 
use a lot of data that was rough, pretty strongly labeled. And that's one of the challenges in general with cybersecurity that we'll probably talk about a lot today is the class imbalance issue. Um, what benign versus bad uh, and how many examples you need. Uh, when you look at malware, file-based attacks, there's a large corpus of data at this point. A lot of credit goes to virus total and antivirus collections and things like that. So you've seen a lot of um, advances in detection on, on file-based uh, malware and attacks like that. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of progress and have seen a lot of progress. I think the, the other place is email, and I'm sure Oday will talk about that. There's been the, the ability to have a, a large corpus there as well. Um, and, and those are kind of the, the, the places I, I think we've made progress. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and then there's challenge because if if if, if we're if, if we don't have the trust and we don't and we and we don't deliver, um, it can set us back. And so there's kind of that 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 balance to strike in in what we're building and how transparent we're being and how explainable we explainable we are, uh, and the impact of being wrong, especially in cybersecurity. That's interesting. Um, Oded, do you want to take a stab at this? Like, do you want to talk about how you perception point kind of like evolved or thinking about you know the differences between traditional methods for um, detection? And and contrast that with like approaches that use um, ML um, or other AI techniques. Yeah, uh, sure. So this is uh, definitely in our ballpark. In perception point, we started from scratch, of course, like any startup. And when you start from scratch, you don't start with machine learning. Basically, we did all the basic algorithm, just like Peter mentioned. You know, uh, signature based and all all sort of the uh, simple uh, engines uh, you can think of, but state of the art today in almost any type of data and for classification basically everything we do of course is classification we want to say mal or not mal basically we of course have many other uh, types of models that tell us uh, classification about the topic of the email or the type of file you know any kind of uh, stuff like that but basically we do classification just like uh, peter said and State of the art classification is done using machine learning in AI. So it was a sure path, right? We knew we were doing the basics. And the minute we can, we start moving forward to use the best tools uh, to do our job. Um, and today, I think um, Peter talked about the size of the data. And I think the size of the data is key. But the, the biggest thing we see today is actually, it, it also relates to data but it's the use of pre-trained uh, transformer models, the large language models, which used a lot of data in their training, but it's not your data. That's, that's I think, the big game changer that you can use open source uh, big language models these days and very easily uh, use a very strong model, which was trained on a huge amount of data uh, for your own use. And we see um, revolutions, I think, uh, in the field of image and NLP, Recently, with these algorithms, we all we all heard about the uh, ChatGPT, and uh, of course we all heard about Dolly, right? Uh, we heard about stable diffusion, and all of these technologies of image and text are all based on these huge pre-trained models. This is what gives them the power, and and this is the shift we see. And but of course, uh, I must uh, also add, you know, uh, machine learning has uh, consistency issues. And by consistency issues, I mean that sometimes it's wrong and, and it's, it could be very wrong sometimes. So basically all of the basic stuff we did, all of the rule-based systems are still intact and still running and they prevent inconsistencies that can happen with, uh, with um, the, the state-of-the-art algorithms, right? Gotcha. Um, thank you for that. Um, Peter, do you want to talk about how you you um, use these technologies today at um, Expel? Yeah, sure. I, I think um, I, I, a lot of how we think about how we apply it today and how we've applied it today comes down to this kind of rallying cry of what we'd say, like, optimize the human moment. Um, managed detection response is traditionally a, a services business, and we always wanted to make uh, the the company we're building um, very efficient and look more like a SaaS business and delivering high quality scale, um, but also um, doing the right thing for customers. So that means we're looking at the alerts, we're doing the investigation, we're we're delivering reports, which is essentially what the investigation resulted in. And so we see a we've used um, machine learning and techniques in it in a couple different ways to kind of optimize that human moment. We're we're not yet at the point where we where where we feel we have to use machine learning to create alerts. 
Um, that's because again, that regex, that like pithy, like, okay, can I solve this with an if statement? Yeah, I can, I can, I can open the aperture some and say, Hey, this is weird looking, or we should look at this. And then I can solve the optimization problem. How do I make the humans more efficient on the alert shows up? What are the steps that a human should take so that they don't have to think about it as much? And they can just focus on some inference on making a judgment. We want them to, to focus on the judgment and not the steps they have to take to make a judgment. And so we use machine learning to create situational awareness. So for example, you can think about this as similarity. Hey, we have this alert. Where else are we seeing this actively in the customer environment or historically have we seen in the customer environment? Create some situa situational awareness. We're 24-7, 365. We've got analysts that, that take on multiple customers. Uh, we don't assign an analyst per customer. So being able to provide that context and say, hey, this is some stuff that's currently going on. You can think about this as almost a similarity problem. What's relevant to the alert that the analyst needs to know to make a good decision? So that's one place we've had a bunch of success. We can also change the priority. We can say, hey, this thing came in and, and an alert was created and then use machine learning to say, hey, based on the alert being created, we think this is higher likelihood of an th active threat change the severity or put it in front of an analyst uh, at a much quicker time time cycle so that they're getting after it quickly. Um, we also use various forms of anomaly detection. We use it for quality control as much as we use it for um, understanding what is or isn't relevant to the analyst. We can look at the decisions that are being made and say, hey, there's a cluster of, of alerts and a set of decisions that all line up and we've got one outlier. Hey, we should review that outlier so we can kind of scale the quality control. So the number of different applications we've found successful. And they all kind of go to this, like, how do we optimize this human moment so that they're making good, they're making a good use of their time, which is for really focusing on the judgments. Nice. Um, you touched on the concept of explainability, and I kind of want to double click on that a little bit. Um, and, and this is a question for both of you, and maybe Peter, you can start us off and then Oded, you can follow up on, on this. So like, um, Peter, maybe you can explain how explainability um, comes into play and kind of like what's the importance of ex explainability um, when it comes to detection. And um, to a dead in, the, in that context, um, when you use um, tools like transformers and other um, uh, kind of uh, other la large language models, um, how do you uh, how can you preserve your ability to explain kind of like why a decision was made um, for better or worse? Um, so Peter, could you start us off with that? Sure. There, there's, there's kind of two ways to think about explainability. There's front of the house and back of the house. So back of the house is going to be like, when we, when we, if we deploy a model, that's kind of in between our analysts and, um, uh, the data and something goes wrong. I, I, I need to be able to diagnose how that happened and why. And if I can't, it's unlikely that I'm going to take the risk of deploying it. it, it it's that that critical because we have to build trust. And so there's the back of the house, which is there's a set of tooling and observability that we want and monitoring. It's good engineering hygiene. It's just good hygiene that we really want to hold ourselves to when we deploy a model and understanding that. Also understanding the data we're using, understanding the supply chain risks of data, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, which, which can go to kind of like some of the risks of building models or using other people's models. Um, so I, I need to understand all of that. And that's the back of the house. The front of the house when it comes to explainability is, you know, a, a, an expression that, that, that my team's tired of hearing, but it's one that I feel strongly, no floating point numbers in our UI. That's not explainable. A, a seven versus a 10 versus an eight and a half doesn't, doesn't work. And so just thinking about ways to say, okay, well, this, this is a confidence interval. How would we frame it? So a user could come in and have it in an English conversation with the, the, the experience. And there's just some basic stuff starting there um, is really useful. I think the 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 challenge is we we sometimes end up you know punching a bunch of uh, output through and not thinking about how others need to use this or what questions they have or even asking yourself why would they trust it right and how would we go about explaining and that's the front of the house that's that user experience that's that UI that's the users interacting with the output of the models and so those are just a few ways I think about it I think there's a lot there's a lot that can be done there uh, and I think we're just scratching the surface in ways to like make that experience something that that builds trust and confidence over time. Awesome, well Dad. So uh, the question was, how do we explain the large language models, especially if they were pre-trained? So uh, how we do it is basically we always look at the end result, right? We look if this email is malicious or not. And then um, since we are working with uh, um, an embedding space, we can look for similar examples, right? And we can see why this attack or why this specific um, data point uh, was malicious. We see anything similar to it, and then we can decide if it's uh, 
right or wrong and how to correct it. So basically, this is mostly how we explain, right? We, we show more incidents which are similar. This is the, the abstract the explanation we give. And of course, you can look at the explanation differently. And a lot of times, uh, people want to know which exact parameters affect uh, different uh, classification uh, results. But for us, it's less interesting because uh, looking at specific parameters of such huge spaces is almost uh, useless. So again, just to summarize, we just use the, the big picture and look at similar stuff to it and, and just uh, you know, try to give some statistical information about the similar ones and all kinds of aggregations. But basically, that's how to explain them. Gotcha. Okay. Um, <laughs> I want to shift gears a little bit um, and kind of talk about the the bigger equation here. And, and so, like, you guys are on the defending side of the equation, um, and there's also the attacking side of the equation. Um, and I wanted to ask um, what you guys think about the way Again, similar to the way that that ML and AI have impacted your your side, um, how do you think um, AI and ML have impacted uh, the attacking side? And kind of like how how do you think that that you have to kind of uh, evolve and respond to new challenges? And what are those new challenges that you're seeing in this space? Um, Odette, if you want to kick us off with that. Oh, sure. This is a great question, and we see it all the time. So as I said before. Uh, language models and any NLP and algorithms uh, which generate text or help create text templates or anything like it are becoming more and more common, right? The same uh, way we use it, uh, it's very simple to use it for malicious purpose. So what we're seeing now is campaigns of emails and websites which have, uh, which were generated by an algorithm and they're just very good. They're getting very uh, different as uh, Peter said before, we see great variation in the, in the signatures and uh, um, we often call it uh, obfuscation. When, when you try to hide the real nature of the file, when you try to make it not similar to a file which has the same purpose, um, trying to evade the detection, and normally we call it uh, obfuscation. So we see a great variance, which is a type of obfuscation, it makes it hard for us to catch uh, this stuff. And so how sorry. do you respond? How do you respond to that? How do, what's what's the mitigation for the, for obfuscation? So um, basically, um, to do so, we have to use the same model to find the, the templates, right? Like if the <laughs> if the content was generated uh, with a model, then we're likely to be able to recognize it with a model. But it's not the only thing, right? So the models not only. Um, use us to ask like a, such a raw question as mal or clean. As I said before, we use models also to decide whether this is a payment request. For example, we classify the entire text. So instead of looking at specific uh, phrases like a regex, like Peter said, instead of using regexes, right, which are very specific uh, for language, for example, uh, in perception point, we see over 120 languages of emails and Regex are not good enough for this type, amount of languages. And also, of course, it's very simple, right? If I, I can't, I can't um, make enough regexes to cover all the payment requests, basically. Right. So uh, a model, uh, you can just ask, is this text similar to payment content? Just like that, actual like text similarity to these specific phrases and get a pretty decent uh, uh, classification. So, um, we're using transformer models in many types of our data and, and on many, um, many types of data and on many points of the scan, right? Some of this data gets fed to another model, which already knows, okay, this is a payment request. It was made by a low reputation sender. This is a, a trigger sign, right? So we have many uh, types of such models uh, in different layers of our, of our algorithm. So to catch advanced threats, uh, we, we use the advanced techniques and hopefully we, we use them uh, better, you know, but it's a cat and mouse game. We see advances all the time. Right. And that's of course, say uh, I only touched text, right? But we see the same thing generating uh, malicious uh, files like variants of malware very easily to obfuscate and, and various um, different obfuscation of code, right? Any um, exploit 
for Office, for example, a, a macro code inside an Office file uh, can be obfuscated very easily and, and, and very sophisticated obfuscation you can't find with regexes. You must use a more complex technique. Gotcha. Peter, do you want to take this on? Sure. I mean, I think I think it is a great job. I, I would I, if we zoom out, what what we're really talking about is uh, an abstraction layer on the variance, right? So what we're talking about in the case of email is there is some there. There's only so many ways to make your intent known as a human to another human. If I'm the CEO and I'm requesting a payment and I'm a, I'm doing that fraudulently, there's only so many ways I can frame that sentence to where the uh, the user who receives it would actually react in a way that results in a payment going out, right? And so using models to actually generate, okay, the intent is payment request. Doesn't matter the way, the ways they phrase those intents, they're going to, it's going to net out as like the topic here, the intent of this request is payment. Um, and when you think about malware, the, the, the counter to all these evasion techniques is, and we don't have to go into the details, but there's a lot of research on the intermediate languages and essentially also abstracting away a bunch of the variants and saying, Hey, the intent of this thing, when it executes is this. And all of a sudden you've removed the the variance. And so that's kind of that that cat and mouse game. There's there's a bunch of performance constraints in there as well. So it's not as simple as like translate to intermediate language and, and win. Um, but I think uh the 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 net of this is I, I uh, offensively there's there's not been a need um uh, like the, it's basic economics. You don't pull out the big guns until you have to. And on the offensive side, there's been so much success that there hasn't been the need for machine learning as much as on the defensive side. I think, uh, I think that, that that's changing because of the availability of some of the techniques and the ways that you can take a model off of hugging face and just start having it help you, which is pretty cool for, for both sides, right? Like just from a research perspective, that availability, that democratization of, of capabilities is pretty neat. And then you have some bad actors and good actors using it. Um, I, I do think that there's a really interesting world where we've talked about like kind of the the ways you target users and, and kind of uh, pinpoint. But I think if you look at what chat GPT is, is in, in all the examples, especially on like the cybersecurity Twitters, there's some really fascinating examples where you're starting to be able to give it kind of the experiential information. And so now, you know, imagine a world where it's like, hey, you've trained a model on hundred, if you're a company that runs pen testing, and you deliver a report to to your customers, you've got a corpus of data that's very unique. And your ability to say, okay, hey, we're going to feed this in. And then, hey, when you can start to, to instruct the model, hey, when, when you see these things, you take these actions. And all of a sudden, you can have to say, hey, can you actually, instead of generate me a red team report, can you actually perform a pen test, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm fast forwarding a bunch. There's a bunch of work that has to be done there, done there, but that's where I think some of this could go. Uh, not ringing the alarm bells, because I think it's, it's still a ways away, and, and there's a bunch of really good security controls that, that make this less scary. But it's an interesting thing to think about where you look at chat GPT is able to take disassembly and tell you a summarization of what that code is doing from an assembly perspective. Well, now you've taught it to reverse engineer. There, I've seen examples where it's actually writing cross-site scripting uh, payloads based on it reading code. Okay, that's cool. And so it is able to kind of take in a bunch of um, experiential uh content and, and and act on it. And I think that's where but we may see more automated attacks. And, and you'd see that in the, the basic economics of like, okay, if I can automate these types of pen tests and these checks and things like that, I might be able to profit as an attacker. And that that's where I think that ends up going potentially. I want to I want to um, just continue this thought with you um, and kind of go beyond chat GPT because <clears throat> I'm also very uh, impressed with what it, but what it could do. Um, but with that said, I feel like there is another um, AI um, that's come out um, in recent uh, in, in the recent uh, couple of months called Cicero um, from Meta, um, which is able to uh, uh, efficiently win uh, in diplomacy using natural language, um, which is quite a different type of feat when you compare it to ChatGPT. We're not talking about chat. Uh, we're not talking about text generation. We're talking about complex. Um, analysis and then communication between um, between agents, um, and I kind of want to ask you if you can imagine like a world where where we are seeing um, uh, like more advanced AIs coming out and kind of being democratized um, with this cat and mouse game, right? Like where you know you, there's always this chase, right? Like what are the attackers going to get? What are the defender? What do the defenders have? Um, is there a way for for um, you know good actors um, and generally people are just trying to defend their own properties and their own um, their own companies and organizations to kind of like inoculate themselves 
Um, is there like some um, organizational kind of attitude um, that that people need to start um, um, uh, putting their their mind into to make sure that like they're they're ready to for for what's coming? Um, as again, especially when we're thinking about the dem democratization of these very very sophisticated AIs that that like you said, right, could be harnessed to do pretty much anything. This is for any anyone who wants to take it. <laughs> Sorry, it's a lot of, a lot to unpack in uh, one question. So basically, yeah. these are all is uh, into a whole different topic. Uh, not only the transformers or big language models, but also reinforcement learning, right? Uh, which is used to train agents as well. But uh, we won't go into that. But basically, you're asking. Uh, uh, where we will see all these types of uh, AI systems. I don't like to use the phrase AI. I feel like it's a bit mm -hmm. meaningless, but we'll see more and more uh, machine learning models being used for actual uh, actual uh, real world challenges. Uh, we keep seeing it more and more. And it will, make, it will make things possible that weren't before, right? We're seeing all these kind of uh, assistants, smart assistants, which you can uh, just uh, talk to or chat to. Um, we see uh, aids, you know, if you look uh, in uh, sensory, all the sensory um, uh, analysis uh, done by many companies uh, in the area of the mind or, or any kind of complex signals coming from the human body. We see great advancements uh, all the time, you know, we'll, we'll just keep seeing more and more. Uh, we're it's big times. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Yeah, sorry for for attacking you with this question there. I just I just thought we we delve the deeper into the future. Um, it feels we like a, you, a you thought about it a lot, like uh, <laughs> at night. <laughs> I mean, it does. I do think that like that's something that we need to start thinking about. You know, like you want to look at where the puck's going, right? Like, so ChatGPT is awesome, but there's there's going to be other things that we're, we need, we need to start thinking about um, as an industry. Um, so there's a question from um, uh, one of our uh, listeners. Um, which algorithms other than transformers are you seeing being relevant to cybersecurity? Um, as again, one of them, and can you share some experience? Sure, I can take that. Um, so of course we, we use many different um, uh, machine learning models. Basically, um, we use transformers to create embeddings of our data. Once you create the embeddings, you have a numeric vector representing the data, and then, comes a second, second phase where you must use this, this embedding, right? So to use this embedding, we use a classifier, right? Uh, so we use both transformers and classifiers all the time. Uh, and a, an example, right? I think this was a good example. I'm not sure. Should I give like sure, a that... real world one? Sure, yeah, please. So for example, you can say, I'm looking to uh, ask the same question. Is this a, a money request? Right? Is this text a money request? So I would just um, take the text, use the transformer to create the embedding, and then use a classifier to decide if this embedding represents a payment request or not. That's the example. Gotcha. Um, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Do you have something to yeah, add? I, yeah, kind of. I think um, the algorithms that 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 you that most companies are using are the ones that have been around the longest and are kind of the bedrock for uh, like there's been a lot of advances and there's some really cool stuff coming but but anything new has additional costs associated with it. if you build a company around a, a GAN you have to be able to inspect it you have to be able to retrain it you have to be able to evaluate it there's a bunch of stuff that comes along with some of the 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 uh, you know, it's it's a it's a few years old now, but but some of these things there's there's costs associated. Whereas um, being able to use classifiers, some you know basic statistical models, these these have a lot of impact, and then you're able to also see where it breaks and then bring in the next thing versus starting with something that's so bleeding edge. Uh, there there's oftentimes a, a desire in a lot of technical fields to go to the bleeding edge thing versus start with the bedrock, you know, regex, random forest, what what have you, logistical, whatever the thing is go to the and then see where that gets you then go to the next thing and the next thing and, and those 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 transitional moments teach you where the weaknesses are and it can actually allow you to select the next thing more effectively uh potentially based on um whatever's going on with that current deployment or capability how you build it. so that's kind of how i think about it um so the the standard 
the standard fare is going to apply, I think, in most places. And then there's definitely places that are able to leverage um, the newer bleeding edge stuff too. It's not to say don't. I just think um, if if you're not a, a big company with a ton of researchers, um, that kind of phased approach makes a lot of sense and allows you to actually move quickly and 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 not have to be stuck in maintenance and understanding of of some of that stuff um, for as long. Yeah, maybe I should add also that uh, the, the, the part of the revolution is not just the technology, but the ease of deployment. All of our big language models today are, are, use, are deployed using uh, an open source uh, Hugging Face Python library and the Hugging Face Hub. All this is uh, openly available for any company uh, for internal use. Uh, anyone can use it. And I think this is part of the revolution, not only the technology, but also the fact that it's more and more simple to deploy in production and for us it wasn't even a major change in our infrastructure to run hugging face huge learning uh, huge language models and wasn't a big change for us and i think that's that's the real big deal and it's like so peter mentioned the the guns and, and all this so basically when you use the large language models which were pre-trained on, on so much data you basically outsource the complex stuff right the embedding should contain a lot of sense. You use the, a huge model with a, a lot of power to create it, but now you have an embedding that should contain a lot of sense for your task, for the, the language task. And then you do the more simple algorithm, like again, Peter, Peter mentioned before, the classifier on this data, a classifier that you can control more simply because it has a lot less uh, variables. And uh, you can also use even more ex explainable decision tree algorithms, right? XGBoost uh, is still uh, the simplest thing to use when you have a uh, tabular data um, and it to could totally handle uh, embeddings. So basically, I think we should still uh, look today to the, to the ease of use. So basically, if I would start a, a cyber company, maybe, maybe I would even start with this because it's so simple these days and it uh, provides uh, very good results. So so easy to, to yeah. Um, do you do any fine tuning on these models once you have them? So of course, like they're they're off the shelf, right? But we we all know that there there has to be some, uh, you know, some customization at least. Uh, um, again, in in specialized fields to like kind of get what exactly what you need. Um, so if if there is a fine tuning process, can you talk about it a little bit and explain how you do it? Yeah, actually, it's a pretty complex fine tuning process because it can be, um, yeah, you can consider two parts of it, right? So the, the first part is the actually you can you can uh, fine tune the model, right? You can show it uh, more data. Um, and then uh, doing this just depends um, if your data looks like the data the model already see. So basically, large language models see in the entire internet. So a text from an email which are abundant in the World Wide Web, uh, would be uh, like the bread and butter of this uh, algorithm, this model. But if I look into more complex text, right? If I look into uh, a script written in Python, right? So maybe today you will also find this in the web, actually. So it might be even uh, good for that, right? But um, let's take a very customized text, maybe, that, that is not abundant uh, in the internet. Then it will be uh, weak. Uh, in, in that specific uh, uh, time. Um, and, and so th the second part of the fine tuning process um, is actually um, when you use embeddings, then you have basically this data set of embeddings and you choose what's in this data set. And for us, uh, since we do real time scanning of emails, files, and URLs all the time in large scale, so basically we have all the time a, a huge amount of uh, traffic incoming. And, and, and we can't even um, use all this data. It's too much. You can't even use it in real time. If you want something to be immediately effective, you must choose the, the data very carefully. So this is the second type of fine tuning. We fine tune the data set. This comes especially important, not only in classification, but more importantly in vector databases. And Pinecone, we use Pinecone for that. Uh, but basically, you can use, when you have embeddings, you can use a classifier or you could use vector similarity. That's the other option. And for us, uh, vector similarity works even better than a classifier. Peter, do you have a take on this? 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, on the like specifically the the like large language model tuning, I think there's there's still a lot of exploration we're doing and how we how we want to go about that. And 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 so I don't want to get ahead of lessons learned. But but I think uh, I'll 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 double down on something Odin said. Use a, a different phrase. Um, uh, there's a normalization process that occurs before the input gets transformed or vectorized or what have you. And that's where I think there's a lot of tweaking that can go on so that you can get better results out of things out of box or make the, whatever you're training more effective. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, being able to take, um, you know, remove either if you think about like NLP, like back in the day, like stemming and things like that. So that, you know, you get rid of the plurality and things like things like that. There's that for, for, for security data, uh, the equivalent and, and arm in getting, getting things to be a little more normal or, you know, hence normalization, uh, allows the models to find similarities where, where previously some of that, um, small differences would actually cause, cause separation that would throw results off. And that's where I think a lot of folks spend their time, um, on top of tuning the model, but, but the, the normalization of the data, um, so that thing, things that are similar actually come together, um, you know, an example could be like, if you have an email address and it's first dot last name, knowing that that, knowing that's the case, uh, and knowing the first name, you can now normalize that to first and last. And ver because you might have variants in the data across different data sources for that user. So basically making so that user is representing consistently throughout your data set, um, has a pretty big, it can, can have an impact, things like that, that you, you, you would, when you saw the data, you'd spot it. It's just stuff like that you you end up running into with with these data sets. Cool. We have one more question from the audience about um, uh, large language models, um, and I'll get to the other question in a second. Um, with these large language models, when dealing with cyber data, do you encounter uh, numeracy issues? E.g., ninety nine is closer to nine than to one hundred, then it doesn't share any characters. It's an interesting question. Yeah, interesting question. Uh, so um, we actually uh, not using uh, large language models to identify numbers, right? Because it's uh, like Peter said, it's it's a more simple task. Some tasks are just uh, better done by regex. So like checking the distance between two numbers, better subtract than use a language model. I also jump in just like uh, this triggered a good example of like two examples of normalization that almost always occur on our data set is numbers become D's capital D we'll just swap that out and then GUIDs just become the, the word GUID so when you have a, a you know uh, those because those can throw things away off and I, they actually don't carry a ton of weight when you're doing the like when you think about someone if I put that alert in front of somebody and I removed a couple numbers uh, and GUIDs, they'd still be able to transact on all the other data and, and make a decent decision. And so when you think about that way, you can remove some of the variance that those things introduce. So it's a pretty common um, thing that will normalize out. Not always, but almost always GUIDs, but but numbers too become usually capital D. You would also see like uh, dates normalized all the time, right? Cool. Um, one more question from the audience. Um, uh, is data availability and class imbalance a major concern? If so, um, any approaches to mitigate? Peter, I think you mentioned class imbalance before, if you want to take that. Yeah, I, I think um, for the majority of problems in cybersecurity, the answer is yes. I think there's there's two places where that, that's a little less true. Uh, the place that's the least true is going to be binary classification. And I don't mean binary, cla the classifying malware, like file bytes. Um, there's just a large corpus that, that folks can access of, of, of good and bad that has a bunch of labeling mechanisms like uh, virus total is the, the best example there. Um, but in general, the class imbalance issue does mean that certain uh, techniques that, that are used in other uh, fields are not available because you, you don't have you don't have supervised at your fingertips. You just don't have, you don't have the, the attack data specifically. You, you have tons of this is what normal looks like and then one attack, right? And uh, a lot of times those are JSON events. And so figuring out how to even vectorize that. And it's a sequence too. Maybe it's normal, normal, normal. They do one thing, normal, normal, normal. Um, so the class imbalance uh, issue, I wouldn't say it's a concern. It just is something that we're aware of when we think about, hey, we have a problem. What are the tools? When we open the toolbox of tools, we know we've got regex. We've talked about that. But what are the other tools? And that's where um, kind of unsupervised clustering and, and tricks like that, where you can start to build clusters and label the clusters 
um, get you moving quickly. And then you can start to build out more loosely labeled data sets that you can leverage over time. So I think it's just understanding the tools and the data and, and how those tools and data then feed your future ability to do more. Um, so it is something that we we're always um, cognizant of when we think about how we're going to solve a problem. Uh, and it does influence the, 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 the toolbox, the tools in the toolbox. Odette, do you have a take on us? Yeah, sure. So I think for us uh, as a detection company, um, for us, it's a major issue. And um, before I go into the imbalance, which is a major issue, about availability. So at our point, uh, since I, as I told you, we have uh, more data than we can use basically. And so data availability is not a problem, but imbalance is a major concern. So just imagine I'm trying uh, to measure and show even internally to show my CEO uh, the FN rates, the FP rates, um, how much we catch and how much we miss, right? So there is a, a great importance to the actual totals of this. You cannot only use the percentages. And of course, every, every one of you knows that some incidents are worse than others, right? So for me, the cost of a false negative is huge. And a false positive is not that bad because it can also always be mitigated, right? So for us, it's a huge, um, a huge difference. And when we develop engines, uh, we have to look into both the false positives and the false negative. Uh, the class imbalance affects us greatly because imagine that we have 1% of false positive. That doesn't sound like much, but if I have a lot of clean emails talking at tens of millions, then 1% is a lot of emails. And if I have a manual IR team uh, looking into it, you know, I don't want it to look at so many emails. Like it can't be, it's not scalable. Uh, so for us, it's a major issue. Uh, we see it uh, in the development of our algorithm, in the deployment of our algorithms. Uh, class imbalance is one of the, the hardest thing in this field, I think. Uh, also, cool. maybe I'll, I'll even add that uh, as a perception point, we don't only scan mail. And we don't only provide uh, one solution. We have also the browser extension, for example, scanning URLs and files that the user browse to. And mm -hmm. this is a totally different use case than email scanning. A totally different time frame. Everything needs to happen uh, faster. And just imagine uh, that the balance there is even more uh, skewed. You see even less attacks there. Like in the email, you see more malicious than in the extension, because that means it actually got to a user if he's uh, clicking it. So it only gets worse. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a quick follow-up um, from the audience, and they're asking, um, are you saying that traditional class imbalance techniques like uh, SMOTE, S-M-O-T-E, doesn't work in this space? So it depends on, on what you're looking for, right? So if you will just uh, and take a data set and try to uh, measure your classification results on it, then of course, these algorithms will help. But the problem is that any data set you, 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 set you take is not uh, proportionate to the size of the data, like the, the real size of the entire data space. So, even if you're good at classifying these 100,000 or 1 million emails, it's, it's not enough. It's, right. it's completely not enough. Yeah, I, I, um, we've tried a few of the techniques. Uh, I think that there, it depends on the, the type of data, like time series data, you, you, your, your, your mileage may vary. We, we've tried it there. One of the things that comes out though is there's additional features, especially if you're looking for like anomaly detection that's malicious, that, that are hard to simulate. Uh, or, or sample because you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so you're going to end up creating uh, the, you know, like IP, if you think about like IP distributions for like authentication data, you end up basing that on what you've seen. Um, and you can, you can end up in, in situations where, uh, especially if you don't have, especially if you only have one or two examples, which is not uncommon uh, to, to get the, those techniques to, to work. Um, it does, it, it would have, might have to know a certain set of things that, that are, um, even categorical uh and that, that can create some challenges and and the, the the categories are defined by like ip country code or something like that and that's where some of this stuff breaks but you can you can use it to get to get uh to grow your data set i think you need uh 
probably need a little more data than than oftentimes you might have in in certain malicious situations um, to be able to leverage these techniques. But I, I think it is it is a, an opportunity. We we looked at using it this specifically early last year on some stuff, and I'm sure we'll again revisit it in, in the coming year. So as I'm not saying it doesn't work, I think there's some when you do specific feature engineering, it may uh, uh, not not be as useful in in certain situations with certain types of data sets. I think, I, think gotcha. that I have the follow up, uh, which is just uh, how we make it work in production. So basically, as I said, the problem is the data is too big, so you can't use a fixed data set. So the trick is just you have to refresh the data set all the time or retrain the model all the time. That's a major issue. But if you keep the model current, you keep retraining it on the current data all the time, uh, then it works. Uh, that's that's basically the, the way to do it uh, in this huge changing field, right? Uh, and also, of course, you don't you must not forget that we have pretty good indicators using traditional algorithms. So let's say they don't catch 100%, but we catch a lot of malicious stuff just based on traditional algorithms. So they provide a very solid base for the algorithm and for more advanced algorithms and uh, taking it from there uh, finding the other 20% are uh, more advanced algorithms. Great, um, <clears throat> thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to maybe um, flip it a little bit around um, as as a as as we were talking about um, large language models and their efficacy, um, what do you think are some of the shortcomings or like the challenges that you see with with using large language models? Um, where where do they fall short? Um, how can they be like the use? How can the use of um, LLMs be improved? Um, what are your thoughts? Um, whoever wants to take this. Um, I mean, I think I, I don't think like my perspective is that there's a, there's just so much opportunity and there's been so many advances so quickly that there's going to we're going to we're going to continue to stub our toe in places that fall short. But I think the the thing that I look at that I'm excited about is the shortcomings. Um, they in a lot of ways feel like they're they're like you're going to hit it and you can overcome it. Uh, you kind of know it where it might be. I think a lot of it has to do with do, domain specificity. Uh, and kind of getting it to understand this this domain, this word, and this domain means a specific thing, which is in a lot of cases already solved, but we might run into mm -hmm. it. Um, and I think that's where we're going to see uh, the, the I, I don't even like the word shortcomings because I, I think it's just like it's a natural progression that's going to occur and it'll just become, it'll get overcome as as we as we, we run into these and they're almost uh, spots where you can kind of look at it and understand and say, okay, I think this is where we're going to get hit and, and actually anticipate that. Um, those are those are the when I think about the and I'm going off of the use cases I think of when I think about applying um, large language models in the context of of managed detection and response operations. Um, there's so much opportunity for generative text, so much opportunity to use it for embeddings. Um, the shortcomings that 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 have me a little worried, uh, I, I think, are are ones that can be overcome and, and they can be discovered um, potentially pretty early. I think you have uh, shortcomings in every method, right? And you have to measure them against each other. And in this case, it's just the, the state of the art. Cool. Um, I think that concludes my um, questions. Um, we can, I don't think we have a lot of time uh, left to delve into a, a, another topic in, in great depth, but. Um, I'll pass it on to Greg to um, close us up. Um, I just wanted to thank you both, Peter and Oded. This was a fascinating conversation. I learned a lot, um, and I'm hopeful, hope, hoping that um, I can talk to you both in the future um, and uh, keep learning more. So thank you for, very much, and to everybody Great. listening. Thank you. I'll, I'll thank echo, uh, I'll echo uh, the thanks from Marie. Just to, before we go, Peter and Oded, do you want to leave anything for the listeners? Uh, uh, articles, job openings, basically, what do you want to plug? Uh, we're always hiring. So expel.io uh, or expel.com both work. Uh, there's a careers page. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got blogs on a bunch of the stuff we've done. Um, some we talked publicly about what we've done with Pinecone and what we've built. Um, and also 
quality control and how we measure uh, efficacy using statistical models like uh, time series analysis and things like that. And so if, if anyone's interested in, in how these apply in security, I, I think our, our our blog, which is just expel.io forward slash blog is a, a great place to check out. And I can send Greg the links to share out. Yeah, I have nothing special to plug in, guys. Feel, feel free uh, to reach in and uh, ask me anything in uh, LinkedIn. And uh, basically, had a good time. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much to you both. And thanks for everyone for listening. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.